Thanks, Joanne, and thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Um, just to give you a little background on, on who I am. So I'm a child and I'm a child and adult psychiatrist, also trained in pediatrics. And so all of my waking hours are spent treating people with autism and mostly other issues like anxiety and depression and things as well, too. So anxiety is a particularly relevant topic, I think. And much of what I'll be talking about is really um, my experiences in my clinical evaluations, reflecting on some of the science, and also um, just kind of joining in on the dilemma that often occurs as we're trying to decipher anxiety symptoms in somebody that has an autism spectrum. And um, hopefully, like I said, my goal is to keep it clinically relevant. Most of it will be talking about symptom evaluation. And of course, I wanna do a, a once over on medications. You're actually gonna get, if you're continuing in the series, Dr. Chris McDougall towards the end of the series is doing a more elaborate and more in-depth medication assessment for anxiety, but certainly I want to make sure we talk about that as well, because certainly it's part of what I do. Um, so for disclosures, which is often um, when we're doing presentations, I have no financial relationships or conflicts of interest. I get paid by no drug companies or anything. And pretty much if we're talking about medications, everything is off-label. And what off-label basically means is our Food and Drug Administration basically um, allows um, drug companies to say that something is endorsed for a certain set of symptoms. And of course, in autism, we really don't have that. And so pretty much everything I'm talking about is off-label, um, but we'll get into that as we move forward. Um, and so like I was saying in, in the introduction, we're gonna investigate the relationship between autism spectrum disorders and anxiety disorders. And we'll talk about the overlap. And I think that's for me the biggest challenge is overlapping um, core symptoms of autism with anxiety. And I'm going to just talk to you about some common anxiety symptoms that I, I look at and treat. And then, of course, we'll talk about anxiety meds um, towards the end. And so um, I'm sure what you so Matthew Goodwin, um, who's a friend and colleague I know, did the initial one. For those of you that um, saw his presentation, I generally, um, I'm sure that many of us in um, logged in and think and thinking about things are often familiar with the autism diagnosis. And so I often, sometimes I'll put a slide up that's, that demonstrates here are the core symptoms of autism. But really what, the way I wanna really think about it is we know the three core symptoms. One is, and the main, the main factor that I always think about is socialization and it's about social reciprocity. It's about relating to other people and it can be um, seen in very different contexts. That includes people that are nonverbal, that can't speak to us, as well as people that are very verbal and can communicate very eloquently about certain things, but may have difficulties in expressing their emotions and understanding the emotions of others. We also have repetition, which can be mental repetition, meaning ritualistic or repetitive behaviors that occur internally, and they can also be physical, meaning stereotypies or stims as we call them, which can be hand flapping, ticks, toe walking, and other sort of self-stimulatory activities. And of course, language is a part of it as well. And we know with the autism spectrum diagnosis, which as we know, change from a few different clusters like Asperger's, PDD-NOS, an, aut an autistic disorder into one autism spectrum um, umbrella, which fits some people's models. Of course, we know it also led to the changing of some nomenclature, including our own A&E, which went from the Asperger's Association of England to, I believe, the Autism and Asperger's Network. Um, so we had some retooling to do a little bit in our nomenclature. So what I think about in general, whether when I'm talking to anyone on the spectrum, is I know we're in a different place than we would be with potentially other patients that I see. So I'm preparing to have some people that can't communicate what they're feeling internally. And that could be literally because of not being able to speak, and it also could be of difficulties introspecting. So the, the, the typical or classic psychiatric evaluation involves, you know, tell me how you feel, um, asking very specific questions about the timing of events and things like that. So oftentimes with someone on the spectrum, we don't necessarily have that ability. And so we have to do a lot of investigative reporting in terms of talking to the patients themselves, talking to family members, talking to school. So we know we're up, we're in a little bit of a different challenge when we're trying to do evaluations on people on the autism spectrum. Um, in terms of the interpretation of motivations behind behaviors, that's obviously a big thing as well too. Meaning we wanna make sure that um, we understand what people are thinking. And that can also be very challenging because I've had many patients come through my doors and while parents are stating, and I'm using that as an example because many of the patients that I treat are 
our children. And of course, even the adults often have adult support um, from their parents. And so I'm actually reflecting on the parents saying, hey, you know, my son or daughter is extremely anxious. Um, but the patient themselves are saying, you know, I don't see it. I don't know what you're talking about. It doesn't make sense to me, too. So we're really doing some investigative reporting as well, too. And of course, we're trying to contextualize the behaviors. We're trying to say what behaviors represent in certain situations and how we interpret physical symptoms or um, reported symptoms as being um, anxiety. And I'm sorry, I know somebody raised their hand and I just saw it and I lost it. So if that happens again, I will click on to that. Um, so the other interesting part about um, having being on the autism spectrum is um, years ago when I first started um, doing lectures and doing my clinical work in autism, I went back to the DSM-4, which is now the DSM-5. It's our Diagnostic and Statistics Manual. And basically that tells us criteria for disorders, right? Or do criteria for um, things like major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, and things like that. And what they did was they went back and they said, all right, here are some diagnoses that if you have a pervasive developmental disorder, as it was as language used back then, now we would say autism spectrum disorder, here are some things that we know are not precluded, but certainly provide certain challenges for making diagnoses in people on the spectrum. And of course, if we look at the, um, the list, these are all things that I definitely treat people on the spectrum for. And we'll get into some more of the specifics too, and you can see my pointer there. So social anxiety disorder and social phobia, I definitely treat people for that. And what the, the DSM-4 was basically um, making a point of is there is overlap between someone who is quiet and cautious in a social situation, but may not be socially anxious. Um, selective mutism, of course, is an interesting one because, um, of course, we have many people on the spectrum who aren't verbal. And so um, that's one that we definitely have overlying um, things for. I definitely treat people for ADHD. I definitely treat people, um, not treat people for pica, but obviously pica is putting non-edible things in your mouth. That's a very common trait that I see in particularly some of our younger kids on the spectrum. Rumination disorder is basically um, regurgitating into your mouth and re-swallowing food, not necessarily rumination like the anxiety disorder. And of course, schizophrenia and these um, schizoid and schizotypal personality disorders are thankfully things that I see rarely and don't come up as often. But the really, the really point of this slide was to say, here are things that we think overlap with and can provide diagnostic challenges and may not be able to be made clearly in people on the spectrum, but we are definitely diagnosing people with these issues and treating them for these issues as well. Um, so with this in mind too, we know that children and adults with, with ASDs are at high risk for anxiety, depression, ADHD. So this, the research, which unfortunately is sparse on these issues, on co-occurring diagnoses, as I like to call them, is, is hard to come by. And so we don't have enough hard research that says, here's what the percentage of people with autism have, or here's what, here's the, the percentage of people with autism have anxiety or depression and things like that. We also know that there is a lot of psychiatric medication prescribed for people on the spectrum. I'll get into some details of that as well. And also we have some psychotherapies that have been adapted for children and adults with autism spectrum disorders and anxiety. So despite the fact that we're kind of told to be cautious about making these diagnoses, we are certainly treating and using medications in these cases as well. So what I did was I took a slide um, from an old study from a guy named Andres Martin, who was, um, he was actually the editor of one of our major psychiatric journals. And this goes back many years to a study that was published in 99, which means it was the data was probably gathered about 20 years ago. It was a study looking at adults for a specific treatment protocol. And what they decided to do is just pull the, the participants and ask, are people on psychiatric medications? And as you can see, many of the participants were on psychiatric medications. In fact, I, I highlighted at the bottom on the red that almost 70% of the participants were on a psychiatric medication. Um, so we are indeed treating, and you can see antidepressants and SSRIs, which we'll talk about a little bit, which we treat with it for anxiety is at the higher end of the numbers as well too. So um, we're certainly doing that. Um, in terms of children receiving psychiatric care for their autism, there's a, a gentleman named David Mandel down in Philadelphia who um, basically looked at a large database from our Medicaid database, and looked at 60,000 kids on the spectrum and found that 56% use at least one psychiatric medication. Psychotropic is, is synonymous for psychiatric. So more than half of the kids were on medications. 
20% were prescribed three medications at the same time, which is can be quite confusing. Uh, as a prescriber, I can tell you that when you have three on board, it's sometimes hard to say which end is up. Now, this definitely happens, and I have many patients on multiple meds, and it ends up being a great challenge, but that's just to um, illustrate the fact that people are trying very hard with medications to make progress. I'm not sure the success rates of these meds, but certainly people are trying. And then the, the use was even common in, in toddlers, zero to two, which was surprising for me. I've never prescribed anybody that young. And three to five years, which really I don't prescribe as well, too. So we're talking about um, a group of clinicians that are struggling to find um, help for some of the kids that are suffering with psychiatric issues. And um, these are just some of the drug classes that were listed. I don't think they're terribly important to know at this point, but they were divided into antipsychotic meds, antidepressants, and ADHD medications for the most part. And I apologize for the formatting on this. I was trying to mess around with a new computer, and there's been some um, issues with that. So, uh, and then we'll get it. When we get into our videos, I'll, I'll have to um, retool some things as well. So, of course. I always think when I started doing this work about 10 years ago, I knew we would have to take a very different perspective, meaning that um, we have to look through the lens of what autism is to get a better idea about what certain anxiety symptoms look like. And I spent a lot of time struggling and contemplating what's anxiety and what's autism. And so what I'm going to do is walk us through the main, I would say, the main few autism anxiety overlaps and how I sort of evaluate and understand which is which. So a popular one that often comes up is this whole concept of obsessive compulsive disorder versus repetitive interest in people on the spectrum. And so a very common report when someone comes through my office doors is, my son is so obsessed with the Transformers or is so obsessed with One Direction or whatever the, the hot topic might be. Um, and we go deeper and we know generally some of the kids and the adults that I see as we've seen, we'll know great detail about these things. Um, one person that I know, I'm thinking in mind, who is um, into the Transformers, knows all the toys, knows all the movies, knows all the different variations on the toys, and can tell you, um, for as long as you'd like to listen, all about these things. Um, the thing about it, though, is these are things that bring him sort of pleasure and joy that help actually stabilize and calm him as opposed to cause anxiety. So what I think about, if you look at the diagnostic manual, which I do sometimes, I think it's very helpful to, um, to sort of, um, oh, sorry, the computer wants to do something, but I'm not gonna let it. Oop. Sorry about that. Um, so obsessions um, is listed in the DSM are recurrent and persistent thoughts, impulses, or images that cause marked anxiety or distress. So an obsession would be something that um, is offsetting as opposed to stabilizing that brings anxiety as opposed to pleasure. So people that have obsessions are often worried about things like, well, I accidentally died today. Will somebody actually um, be, um, receive bad harm? Will I get sick or get infected with something? And that can often be um, pretty unsettling for that particular person. And the compulsions are acts designed to counteract those thoughts, impulses, or images. So for instance, the classic one is, I have an obsession that I'm gonna die of an infectious disease, so I'm washing my hands repeatedly until they're raw and cracked, and of course the compulsions don't actually counteract the obsession as well. So that is a little, is quite different of course than the restricted repetitive interests of someone on the spectrum in the sense that the interests themselves are actually can be stabilizing, they can be helpful, and they can also be something that the person gravitates towards, and they're not driven necessarily by an anxiety. Now, I've seen it, though, where many people on the spectrum have had both, where they've had maybe someone's really into the Transformers, and they're happy to talk about it, and they're overly restricted in it, and they can't sort of get off that topic, but then they sort of get an obsession that, Maybe when am I going to get the next toy or will the next movie come out soon? And they can't sort of, um, they get anxious about what will happen with it or how they'll receive these things. And so there definitely can be an interplay between the obsessions and the repetitive interests as well too. And also, um, and this is a little, on, this is kind of related is when people have um, tics or stereotypies as well. Sometimes people think those are compulsive acts, but often I feel like those are actually 
um, stabilizing or regulating acts that I think help people to sort of calm down, whereas the compulsions with the obsessions kind of um, run through this very hard um, cycle. And in fact, the compulsions lead to the obsessions and you end up in this vicious cycle, which can be very problematic. So what I think about is we're sort of, um, in our diagnostic assessments, we're sort of putting a square peg into a round hole. But I like this picture because clearly someone's tried to shave off the corners of the peg to make it fit. So when we use terms like obsessive compulsive disorder in autism, we might be using a misnomer, and hence trying to use a term that might not be applicable. The other thing to think about too is, and we'll talk about this towards the end, is treatments for OCD don't necessarily work for treatments for repetitive interests. In fact, they're quite different. And so making that, distingu that, that, that distinguishing mark is extremely helpful in terms of making good treatment decisions as well. So um, another part, another diagnosis we have is something called generalized anxiety disorder. And so when does generalized anxiety disorder occur in someone on the autism spectrum? Um, Basically, a generalized anxiety is sort of like a, a sticky armed octopus that is constantly seeking out things to be anxious about. So the anxiety lives within the person and it could be anything. It could be about um, the schedule. It could be about how do we have enough money? Do we have enough gas in the car? Are we going to make it somewhere? And generally those people can appear very keyed up, have sleep difficulties and muscle tension as well. So we can, I, I can think of many people that I've treated over the years that have had those symptoms, right? That have been keyed up, having trouble sleeping and, and tension. Um, but the tricky part is, is, is that is the tension and the problems related to a persistent worry? Generally what happens when I think about generalized anxiety, it, thankfully that type of anxiety is pretty in front of us. I see a lot of children and adults who are constantly worried about things. A very popular one to worry about, I think, is scheduling. What's coming next? First this, then that. That can um, create quite a bit of anxiety. And so I find that those on the spectrum can certainly have the, the keyed up sleep difficulties and muscle tension, which uh, as an independent thing, which might be part of the stress-related autism. But of course, it can be intermixed with the generalized anxiety. And so I'm looking for and those that are nonverbal, I'm looking for a lot of kids that look like they're anxiously anticipating something, um, look like they're uncomfortable on a regular basis, and sort of have maybe sweating or, or tremors or other things that indicate that they're quite uncomfortable. Um, as in OCD, of course, too, it's the dysphoric thoughts and feelings that, that help us understand the anxiety. So if someone who's nonverbal, I might have to make the assessment and say, hey, based on the fact that they're really looking anxious in certain situations, that they look like they're anticipating things, we might have to start anxiety treatment. And of course, with those that are verbal, sometimes I think that's a place where we can often get um, some more details to help us understand whether we're treating for generalized anxiety or simply someone who has internal tension and we're doing different relaxation exercises for that. So another one that's come up often, and so um, I'm part of a clinical advisory group for a and &E, and I was meeting with Danya Jekyll and, and several other um, clinicians, and another interesting one that comes up is post-traumatic stress disorder and autism spectrum disorders. And we're actually, our next meeting will be um, a more in-depth discussion about what that means. And so post-traumatic stress disorder is defined by having a very specific um, um, trauma that has occurred, often life-threatening. It can be assault, it can be sexual assault, it can be um, um, a fire, it can be a car accident. And that trauma reverberates throughout that person's life. They have them symptoms of hyperarousal, meaning that if they hear odd noises or they're reminded of a situation, they look like they're on guard and they need to protect themselves. Social withdrawal can be part of that. And also, um, in particular, as I was saying with generalized anxiety, hyperarousal and social withdrawal can be a very um, strong component of people on the autism spectrum as well, too. Um, the other thing I think about is um, many people are often, and so I just got, I'm just looking at um, a question that, yes, the symptoms, the items I'm talking about is the same for adults and as children. So they're pretty much interchangeable in terms of that. So I would use the same evaluation strategy for children as well as for adults. Um, the other part I, that people often talk about is, is chronic trauma affecting those on the spectrum, meaning a life spent um, contemplating and worrying about and thinking about what other people are feeling or understanding. And I definitely have a, 
I really enjoy doing both adults and children in terms of my clinical caseload. And what I find with many of the um, Asperger's adults that I see who are, you know, working on high level jobs and doing things is the constant stress that comes from deliberating whether they've done something right or wrong or whether they're, how they're being received. The question is, is that a trauma that translates into a post-traumatic stress, which would include hyperarousal withdrawal, flashbacks and other things too. So this is probably one of the hotter topics. And I tell you, I struggle with it mightily in the sense that I'm not sure all the time whether it's PTSD or not. And so um, the question is, is trauma also processed differently? And I just reviewed an article that will be published shortly in regards to, there's some theories that say that people on the spectrum, because of some social distance, may not process or understand or feel a traumatic assault or other things in the same way and hence be shielded potentially from that traumatic experience of being violated, or are they more sensitive by being on the spectrum too? And that's an answer that we don't, that's a question we don't have the answer to. And so I always think about, is trauma part of this person? And if so, do we treat it um, with therapy? Do we treat it with medications? And so a large part of PTSD, as you see in my last bullet, is considerations for group therapy. Now, that also provides a huge challenge, right? To sit with a group talking about feelings and experiences can be extremely intimidating for people that have experienced trauma as well as people on the spectrum. And that combination can make that group therapy particularly challenging. So um, when I first got into this um, research and clinical field about 10 years ago, I was really, really um, interested in this in the social anxiety because I think that makes sense. We have here we have people that have difficulty with socialization. Wouldn't it make sense that social anxiety would be something to explore? Now, if we saw from our previous slide, we know that people on the spectrum were excluded from the social anxiety disorder diagnosis. Now, what happened was I sat down with some anxiety experts here at Brown, and I was um, saying I wanted to do a study, and we'll talk about what the study was. Um, and, um, and look at social anxiety. And what the first question came up, now this is from a group that does anxiety work, not autism work. They're wondering if the social, if people on the spectrum can socially register things to make them socially anxious. And what the real hallmark of social anxiety is that people are fearful of humiliation and opinions of others. The answer for me, I'll tell you, doing the clinical work is a resounding yes. But that's not everybody. So we have, I think we have um, some polar, some polarization here. I definitely have some patients who I know are not socially anxious, who aren't concerned at all about what people's appraisal of are them, of, are them. And I have definitely those that are extremely aware. And, you know, and that just goes for the, the variety we call heterogeneity of the diagnosis, meaning everyone has a different approach. So there are polarizing parts, registering and non-registering, and then there are a lot of people in between. So I'm very clear that people can be very aware of these, of these things. And actually, I think it can be quite magnified in someone on the spectrum. The other thing, the tricky part is, so let's say somebody walks into a room. And many years ago, I think it was 10, uh, 2010, we did an anxiety talk at A&E MIT. And um, one of the anxiety experts there was bringing up the issue of if somebody walks into a room and they withdraw or retreat or are not interested in being there, does that mean they're socially anxious? And I think with people on the spectrum in particular, we have to be very aware that there are sensory issues. I have many people that I treat who are just saying, look, it's just an overwhelming experience. It's not about the fact that I'm worried about being appraised or um, judged by others, but it's just a lot of sensory stuff too. Big crowds, noise. Um, I have one new adult that I've just evaluated who worries so much about the logistics of a social situation, wanted so badly to participate, but had to think carefully, where will I sit? Who will I sit with? What if someone asks me this question? How will I answer? A lot of deliberation, and that can be very stressful for sure. And of course, one of the more popular therapies that are looked at are cognitive behavior therapy, and for many reasons, it's very it's it's easier to study as opposed to other types of psychotherapy, which are more fluid. Cognitive behavior therapy are about um, restructuring some of your thoughts about um, your anxieties, and then. <clears throat> figuring out ways to counter that, you know, rationalizing, this is not the truth, things can be done differently. Um, so definitely a lot of cognitive behavior therapies have been worked on for social anxiety. So what I, what it usually comes down to is, I think about this thing called the inner state. Now the inner state is that um, thing that allows us to relate to ourselves and relate to others. 
And as we know with people on the spectrum, as I was saying, that there's a lot of variability in what that interstate can be like. So when I'm meeting, I'm using kids as an example, but it can be adults. I, like I said, I can struggle with a 30-year-old person with Asperger's as much as I can with a nonverbal five-year-old in terms of understanding what the symptoms represent and what that person's doing. So sometimes I, I really need the reports of the parents. How, so how reliable or valid are self-reports in adults and children on the spectrum? For many, absolutely. For others, not so sure. And can parents tell us more about their kids or their, whether it be adult kids or younger children um, with ASDs than the, the, the children themselves? And can we look at something more concrete and biological to help us understand emotional processing, something that we don't need to ask a question about that, that, that can be shown and demonstrated scientifically? And the other part, too, is another big thing that comes up is when I'm seeing patients, they have neuropsych testing, which is, um, you know, it can be IQ intelligence, it can be um, behavior, it can be emotional stuff, but basically they do a lot of paper and pencil type of evaluations and 95% of the time people on the spectrum rate higher on things, whether it be anxiety, ADHD, depression, and I don't think we have any good measures to say if I give this measure to someone on the spectrum, I can reliably understand their their diagnosis that is very hard to come by and we don't really have measures for that. And so it all ends up being conversation, ends up being really rolling up your sleeves and getting down to business and talking to families and people about how they're doing and making some educated guesses on what might be going on. So what I did 10 years ago when I started research is I said, all right, I want to look at social anxiety and I want to look at something more concrete that can help us understand how people are behaving and responding to stress. So what I did was, thankfully, I had this clinic where I was seeing kids on the spectrum, so I had access to um, people. Now, I, I used the term Asperger's disorder here because that was the term, and of course, that's how it was published. So I, I, I really enjoy it. I think the Asperger's diagnosis, you know, it was around for about 20 years. It might make a return. The DSM can change, and frankly, the DSM doesn't resonate with me as much as being a valuable tool. But So I use the term Asperger's disorder still. So what I did was I said, all right, let's take a group of, I did eight to 12 year olds because that's what I had better access to. And then um, some of the instruments I was using were specific to that. And in research, you just got to pick an age group for the most part. It's hard to say I'm going to do a study with kids from five to 20 because they're so different developmentally. So I said, let's take 19 kids with Asperger's and 12 without and, and, and um, expose them to a social stressor. And I'll explain the social stressor in a moment. And what I did was it involved, I wanted to get anxiety reports from the parent and the child. The mask and the spake, don't worry about what those are, but those are anxiety measures. So I wanted child self-report uh, and parent self-report of anxiety. And then during the event, I also wanted the people participating to tell us how anxious they were and as they were going through it. What we measured during the stress, which I'll go into the detail of, are three different components. The first one is electrodermal reactivity. What that is, is your fight or flight response. That is the sensation you get when you start sweating, when your heart rate goes up, when you feel mobilized, when you feel anxious and nervous and stressed. That is the EDR. It's a sympathetic nervous response. And we can actually measure that by putting um, stickers on the ends of the fingers and hooking it up to wires that can register the electrical impulses that lead to those things. And so that's the pure fight or flight. I'm, I'm revved up. I got to go. And um, we can measure that directly. So that's this one. The other thing we measure is heart rate variability or vagal tone. That's the opposite. That's the calming effect. So whenever we have, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Whenever we have um, an arousal response, we have a counteracting nervous system or vagal system that can counteract that and slow us down. And depending on what we're experiencing, it can go up or down. So that is the opposite. And then we also um, tested something called salivary cortisol. And what we can do is cortisol is a hormone that we make in our body that responds to stress. So if I go through a stressor, within about 15 or 20 minutes, my cortisol levels will rise. They tend to be higher during the early morning. So we often did this experiment later in the afternoon to make sure we had low baselines. And then we would so measure three things, their hyperarousal, their calming experience, and cortisol, which is just a measure of stress. And so this is my illustration of how to think about the EDR and the vagal tone. So the EDR is the gas, right? That's the thing that pushes forward that says, all right, I am I'm nervous and I need to activate. And the vagal tone is the break. So that's the thing that comes down and calms. Now you could, we don't know much about why, how these things interact. We can have somebody who's got the gas high and the brake on, in which case that would be a very uncomfortable situation. But if you think about a rabbit that's being stalked by an animal, they have both. They have the gas on and the brake on, and they pop the brake to move. 
Um, sometimes the brake is on totally and the gas is completely off in relaxation, but that's a good model to think about. And the cortisol, like I said, is just an overarching um, symbol of stress. So, oops, sorry, so what I'm gonna do, I just have to do a quick, because my technical challenges, I am going to um, turn my voice off for a moment and then, actually before I do that, Sorry about that. So what I'm gonna do is um, tell you about the stressor. So what we had the, the people do is, um, there's three. Co there's two components to it. The first one we wanna do to, to, to replicate a stress is to, is to have, we had these kids come in, we hooked them up to the wires, they had wires on their chest to measure the bagel tone and on their fingers to measure the EDR. And then we said, all right, sit down, and um, we're going to start, we're going to give you a story to start with. And basically the start of the story is you and your friend go into a spooky house, dot, dot, dot. We leave the room and say, prepare your speech, about five minutes. So they're preparing their speech. Then what happens is we come in and we ask them to um, tell us the speech. Now what happens is we have them stand up. And unfortunately, it is a very stressful thing to administer. And you'll, I'm in the room with another gentleman you'll see on, on the video as well. We actually are trying to be somewhat supportive, but not too much, because remember the stress we're inducing is evaluative, meaning that we um, are um, being kind of stone-faced. We're giving supportive terms, but we're not asking, we're not giving that yay, rah, rah thing that we instinctually do with children. We're trying to be kind of quiet about it. The stress comes from feeling evaluated as well as the length of time. So no matter how long it takes, the, whether the patient, if the person has a 30 second story, they still have to talk for five minutes or so. So there's a quite a bit of stress induced in that too. And um, the first person we're gonna see is participant one. Um, he had um, a stressful reaction and we'll see. So just remember this was a particularly stressful one. Me at uh, people at my center, we do not torture children in general. This can look kind of painful and kind of dramatic, but bear with me and then we'll um, pause for a moment to talk about the next person, what they did. So I just need to change my audio here. So you're gonna hear, not hear my voice for a moment while you watch the video, and you're just gonna hear the video, um, uh, the video audio from there. And then do me a favor also, when you, um, you you're, turn down your audio a little bit, it tends to come out a little bit louder, so you might have to just tune down your volume a little bit to hear it well. Story from the spooky grandmother or lady allowed was going to allow the children to visit her on a regular basis. Okay, that's the story. Tell me more about what Mrs. Jones uh, gave you or gave the kids. Just a surprise. What other surprises did, did Mrs. Jones get? Mm -hmm. Tell me more about the family and, and the friends that were here. This part is over, Andrew. Can you please serve how you're feeling right now? Try the math problem, or would you like to take more of a break? You did a really good job, Andrew. We're going to break. Sure. Take a break as long as you You can sit down and relax. Do you want me to tell you about what the next activity is? If you want to, Andrew, we can stop. Take a break. You're doing a good job. You can do it really 
way. So um, in some ways, uh, and this is a webinar, of course, I can't see everyone's faces. This is the point where I usually see some aghast looks, like I said, that we torture children. Um, but of course, this was the worst one that we had. And I wanted to give it a demonstration just to show how emotionally reactive it can be to participate in these um, events. Two things, the pink bar going up and down is irrelevant, it's a timing bar, so it doesn't represent his level of arousal. When he circled the, um, that thing on the paper, and I asked him how he felt, he pointed to it because I had a zero to 10 rating for anxiety, he circled adamantly 10. Now, just to give you, um, tell you what happened, this young man continued with this protocol, did the rest of it, continued being my patient, thankfully, um, and um, was able to recover quite well. Now, the next person that I'm going to show you is quite different. The second part of the um, evaluation is doing what we call serial subtraction. So we switch away from the story, and then we go to um, subtracting high, lower, um, small numbers from higher numbers. So what we do is we start off with 100 minus 2, and you got to go 98, 96, 94. And what happens is it, the better you do, the more difficult it gets, and the worse you do, the easier it gets. But the, still the goal is to um, be under evaluation. We have, you will have to start over if you go too slow. If you mess up, you have to start over. So the stress can be in the fact that you're kind of trying to maintain um, a cognitive um, attachment to these tasks while we're, at, we're saying, while we're sort of, like I said, looking stone-faced at it as well too. So let's take a look at, I'm gonna switch the sound back and you're gonna not hear me, you're gonna hear the video and then I will um, comment afterwards. But we'll take a look at this young man doing serial subtraction. Okay, so that was a little different experience. Now this young man seemed to be kind of cooler. Um, you notice there was a couple of times where he was slow and Matt, who was sitting there, who's now a neuroscience um, student at Brown, was correcting him. Um, but he did quite well. Not, not as emotionally reactive, obviously, as participant number one. He's, and I didn't, my, for some reason, my participant number one and two didn't come up, but this is number two for future reference when I go to the next slide. And, um, and so it, it was a different experience, a different experience for us. I'll tell you one thing, when the person's less stressed, I'm less stressed. Sometimes I wonder if I had the wires on me and check my course, I would not be happy as well too. So with that in mind, So, so um, the question is, who is on the spectrum? So participant number one um, or number two, and I'll have um, Joanne can put up a little survey um, and see, and everyone can check off who they think has Asperger's, number one or number two. And I'll wait a moment so people can chime in. And of course, there's no, um, don't be worried, they're not being graded on this. This is simply just uh, to, you know, see what people think. <laughs> 
And I guess I'll wait for, I think it'll pop up in a moment when people have. So there oh, are um, three quarters of the Joanne people have voted. I understand if that's the case. So three, three quarters of the people have voted and it looks as though 60% went with number one and 47% went with number two. And I know it's not an easy, um, it's not a trick question either. I guess it's more, um, it really challenges our construct of um, what is Asperger's and everyone has a different interpretation. And so some people are very clear it's number one, some people are clear it's number two. I still, I continue to be um, never sure, to be honest. So we'll close the, it doesn't look as though the other four people are going to vote. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. So before we get to the answers, um, I wanna go over one of the findings that I think is relevant to um, our experiment as well too. So, um, Here's our cortisol. So we talked about the gas and the brake, which we'll talk about a little bit more in terms of the EDR and the vagal tone, but this is the, um, the stress hormone response. So um, this, these line, this, period, this part here, which I'm showing my cursor, represent when they first come in. This point here represents before they have um, the stressor, before they have the story as well as the math. Now what happens is, if we look at the yellow line, for instance, the yellow line goes from the pre-stress to the post-stress, it goes up. That is what we call a typical response. We would expect that the stress would induce a, um, would increase our cortisol level. And then after um, a little adjustment, it comes back down. So this person in yellow had the typical response. This in red was actually the opposite response. Now this is not totally out of the realm of, norma of, of people doing it, but it's certainly different. The person in red actually had a higher level than when they ended. And so, um, I guess I went to the next one. So um, I don't think, I'm just wondering if Joanne, if we have the results of the poll or not, if I have, to, if I have access to that. We um, do, so can you hear me? But why, we can always go back to it. So let me tell you who was who. Um, participant number one was on the spectrum and he had the atypical um, cortisol response. I'm sorry, I lost the picture there. Um, participant number two, was not on the spectrum, I'm sorry about the loss of the image, but he had a typical response of the cortisol too, went up and back down. So despite the fact that participant number one had a very stressful looking response, his cortisol did the opposite of what we'd expect. The person number two went up and then came back down. Participant number one is actually the one who's on the spectrum. Um, and he um, had the more emotional response, someone would consider that atypical, but he also had more, different than his atypical behavior response was affecting an atypical cortisol response. The young man, number two, had the typical response, and but also didn't look as stressed. So there's kind of some confusion there, too. Um, and what I was thinking, and what we ended up happening in our study was that we found that people uh, with Asperger's were twice as likely to be cortisol non-responders than control. So the Asperger's people were more likely to be the red line, where they dropped their cortisol, the opposite response, as those um, not on the spectrum. Um, the interesting part is there are no differences in the break in the gas between the, the participants. So when it was stressful, we'd expect, like we'd say, the gas goes on, the break goes off. But there was no real differences in the overall levels of their arousal activity during that. Um, we did have one small finding, a third point, which is kind of less relevant. I don't really think about that much, but it was kind of digging for stuff. But overall, the one finding was that stress seems to biologically go in a different place for people on the spectrum. But of course, this was a small study preliminary and doesn't answer questions, of course, too. So um, following that, we had the thought about, you know, what's next? So if we think about what cortisol does, so if our bodies are the break and the gas are going the same for people on the spectrum, but there's a cortisol response, the cortisol response is triggered by many things. You have to, you have to feel the response, you have to view it, hear it, feel it, it goes to your brain, it goes through parts of your brain, triggers a hormone to be released that goes to your adrenal glands and releases this. So the path towards differences can be anywhere in the body, from when you take it in to when you process it to where it comes out. And so we don't know why exactly there's a stress, but we do know that people that experience stress on a regular basis or acutely often do have this experience of 
um, had this, this quality of having a lower cortisol response to stress. So people that might have been sexually traumatized, physically traumatized, or have experienced of trauma can often have that. So it begets the question like I asked about the PTSD, what's the experience like? And the answer is we don't know. And we're continuing this research. And actually, Matthew Goodwin, who gave the first lecture of the series, was um, is one of our partners in this and looking at those EDR and those vagal tones and looking at different social contexts to see if we can see a difference overall. So it's a huge challenge. Um, so let me talk a little about the medications because certainly that's something that I get asked often. And if you, when I first started my clinic, the most common um, statement by the parents or the participants or the people coming in was, uh, "Listen, I." I want to get treatment, but I'm not interested in medications. After, thankfully, my reputation in my area became, why this guy just doesn't prescribe meds, thankfully, we had more people coming in saying, listen, I want to just know more about what my, uh, my symptoms are and understand them better in my child or in myself. And so what happens is um, most studies, which are still very sparse, we need more of these, and unfortunately, we don't have a big research base that's exploring um, medications and autism that much. We look at specific behavior instead of diagnostic criteria, which I like to do. I'm not a big fan of the DSM. And so we say, let's take people that are anxious, that are depressed, and try them on different treatments or medications to see what happens. Um, there have been some, remember I said there were no instruments that really were illustrating or helping us understand how behaviors are manifested in people on the spectrum. But we're trying to develop more, specifically one about anxiety is being developed right now as we speak. And what we do is we try to take successful strategies in neurotypical children, and, um, and apply them to children and adults with ASDs and similar behaviors. So basically you can say, hey, you know what? Um, I have experienced, um, I have a kid not on the spectrum and he had this type of anxiety. Um, this person is on the spectrum. I'm gonna try this medicine and see how it works. So we're often, and child psychiatry started off that way too, where we're using a lot of adult research and data to help drive the medications. But of course we realize we need to study this in children because children are very different than adults. So we're constantly challenging ourselves <clears throat> to do the work. We don't have a lot of research on it. So what I did also is thinking about anxiety and, and just things in general, as I said, let's take a look at problem behaviors targeted by psychiatric medications. And what I did was I just took all the list of stuff, you know, basically hyperactivity and inattention, all the things that are listed here. And I said, all right, these are all things that medications, um, that psychiatric medications are, are targeting. And then I said, all right, let's take a look at um, the side effects. And unfortunately, the side effects and the problem behaviors targeted do not differ that much. Um, and that, I, I use this to illustrate the point that whenever we're prescribing medications for anxiety, for example, I'm always wondering, are we making it worse? Are we under treating? Do we have the right diagnosis? Do we have the right medication? The side effects can often resemble the, the exact things that we're trying to treat. And so every time that someone's coming back to me, and I've done this, you know, probably like three or four patients just today, I'm contemplating with the families, with the patients, what exactly is going on here? And I'll tell you, I just had an example this morning where a young man who was extremely obsessive and extremely perseverative, they started on a medicine, started getting worse. And they started getting real worse. One of the parents said, I think it's because of the med. The other parent said, I don't think we have enough med on board. And I tell you, I can't tell you what it was. We decided in this particular case to take him off the low dose of the medication he was on to see if it was making it worse. And if it was making it worse, obviously we wouldn't go back to that medicine. But if it didn't change anything, we have to go back to that med potentially to try and treat the anxiety too. Let's talk a little bit about some of the medications that I use for people with anxiety. So antidepressants kind of get the most airtime, I think, when it comes to treating anxiety and depression. In this case, we're talking about anxiety. The main family of medications are called serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. They have evidence in children and adolescents with anxiety and depression. They have a lot more and very robust evidence for working on anxiety in adults. Serotonin, SSRIs come in, 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 in many, many types. When I think about when I prescribe the SSRIs, I don't have one that I'm necessarily committed to. Um, I, I often use things like sertraline, which is Zola. I use escitalopram, which is Lexapro. I use citalopram, which is Celexa, Prozac, which is fluoxetine. But there's not one that I can say, I think I use more sertraline because I've just had more success with it. But um, I tell families when we start medications like this, it's sort of like going down the soda aisle of the, of the grocery store. You go to the cola aisle, you have Coke, you have Pepsi, you have RC Cola. Everyone is kind of the same thing, but each one is a different chemical basically as well. So I'm a Pepsi person. I can definitely prefer Pepsi. It doesn't mean that um, my, my wife is a Coke person. 
everyone has their own different preferences and tastes. The side of meaning each person, despite the fact they're in the same family, they're different chemicals, each person's gonna respond differently. So I might have one person who responds well to Prozac, but not to sertraline and vice versa. So it's always um, an educated guessing game at the beginning to say, all right, maybe someone in the family had was on one of these medications. I'm like, oh, that would work well for their anxiety. Maybe it'll work well for their son who shares half his genes with that person. So I always think about, I'm, I'm very unfocused on the actual brand or the specific medicine and more focused on the type, in this case, the SSRIs. Uh, many years ago, about 15 years ago, the US, the, the US, the Federal Drug Administration, which I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, put a bat black box warning that spurned controversy over the use of SSRIs. What it said was, if you're an adolescent particularly and you're being treated for depression, you can have suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Now, that ended up being a very bad decision on psychiatry's part, and most people, even those involved in decision-making, felt it put us back many years. We made people afraid of these medicines. And the bottom line is when I'm treating someone on the spectrum for anxiety, I have very little concern for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. But of course, I mention it because if you open up the bottle and you look at it and say, oh my God, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, that's a concern as a parent. So that was one thing that we had to sort of um, understand and treat, and I explain it just as I explain it to you guys. This is not something that I worry about. It's something that's listed, but um, these medications can make big differences. Um, some people in the past have done research on these, this family of medicines for use in ASD behaviors, including repetitive behaviors and anxiety. Well, going back to my discussion about OCD is, um, OCD is, is well treated by these SSRI medications, Zoloft, Prozac, Lexapro, all those things. But repetitive behaviors are not. So if someone is strictly on, restricted on certain topics and talking and thinking about things on a regular basis, these medications are not helpful for that. They are really for those anxiety, those dysphoric unsettling thoughts and behaviors like I was talking about earlier that really drive the ship towards SSRIs working. So I prescribe SSRIs for anxiety and those on the spectrum in similar ways I prescribe them for those without ASTs. So meaning when I find anxiety, whether they're on the spectrum or not, I find these anxiety meds to be helpful. The tricky part, like I was saying in the first part, is getting, sometimes getting to the place you prescribe the meds is the easiest part. The hardest part is all that deliberation that I talked about earlier in the presentation that says we have to figure out what this is. And so once we get to the SSRIs, not that it's necessarily going to be successful, but I feel like, okay, we've established that this is what we're treating and this is what we're going to use. And so um, I do use Zol sertraline or Zoloft probably more often just because I've had more success with it. But I'm always challenging myself to say, hey, let's not get stuck on one particular medicine because there are many out there and one could be better than the other. We, have, we don't really have tests, to, biological tests to say this person's gonna respond to one versus the other. We still have to sort of experiment with it. Um, and sometimes I definitely had it where someone's mom was doing well on Prozac and I said, let's try it and it went miserably. And then I've had some people who said, my father had a terrible side effects from Zoloft and we tried it and it worked great. So we, um, but we always have a trajectory. We say, if this doesn't work, here's our next one. Here's where we go from there too. So SSRIs um, are probably the mainstay for most types of anxiety. And I'll talk about a few other different types of meds as well too. So other anxiolytics, anxiolytics is just another term for anxiety medication. So um, the families include things like other antidepressants, which have serotonin effects, but also norepinephrine effects. These could be things like Effexor or mirtazapine, stuff that many people are on. And they're in the same kind of ballpark as the SSRIs but they have a little different neurochemical functioning in the brain. Benzodiazepines are another one. Those are things like Ativan, also known as lorazepam generically, Clonopin, also known as clonazepam. Those are things that I find are often effective as we call PRNs or as-needed medications. So someone might be on an SSRI for their panic, for their PTSD, for their obsessive compulsive disorder, and um, they might be, uh, say, on, on Prozac. If they have real breakthrough anxiety, they might take something like lorazepam, also known as Ativan, or they might take clonopin or things like that too. Some are on standing doses of the benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines work on the same receptor as alcohol, meaning if you've experienced drinking alcohol, you know that you know it can relax you and calm you down. A little too much can make you a little loopy and belligerent potentially too. So balancing the, the levels can be very important as well too. Antihistamines, believe it or not, are something that we use. Antihistamines are allergy meds. The most common ones that we use are things like dipenhydramine, which is Benadryl, and um, Atarax. Um, I can't remember the generic name for Atarax, but these are things that for some reason, like I take, like sometimes we use Benadryl to help us fall asleep. 
Benadryl can also be just cut the edge enough as it as needed to help decrease the anxiety as well. Of course, we know, as I mentioned with the benzodiazepines, some of these medications that cause disinhibition and irritability. So we have to be very careful, like a little Ativan can be helpful too much, can cause someone to be loopy or sedated. Um, and I said, some are, the most of the ones I'm talking about in this category are mostly as needed um, area. And also we use them in children and adults. I think um, benzodiazepines are used less commonly culturally where I practice, but you know, as you work with these kids more, I found more um, reasonable uses for these meds. Um, and that made some big differences in kids' anxiety using both the SSRIs and some of these other antidepressants and anxiety meds as well. So I like this slide here, I've always used it. So meds, the ultimate solution, question mark, and of course you can read at the bottom, take the green pill to peel, feel hunky and the yellow pill to feel dory. I wish it was that simple. I would say oftentimes when I'm using medications, it's really under the premise that we can, there are some people who clearly have um, need that neurochemical help in order to make progress. So any, um, so the example, the young man, I said we took him off his sertraline because we were unclear whether it was making it worse or not. Originally when I met that family, I had to, I was explaining what it would be helpful for. And there was reticence, understandable reticence. And we walked through that and talked about it. And I said, look, this might not be the cure-all, but it's worth a shot. And what I said to them was, it might take the medicine to put lower their anxiety so that we can, we can be more helpful to them. If your anxiety level drops, you might be more receptive to therapies, you might be more receptive to redirection, and calming the body down can be helpful for making progress in terms of neurocognitive effects, meaning working on the anxiety and, more, and different therapy ways to help decrease the anxiety. So oh, this is a slide. I, like, I kept this slide on. So this is a slide from um, 2010. I went to New Zealand, actually right before the A&E talk on anxiety. And New Zealand has two islands, the North Island, which is actually a warmer climate in the South Island. I, we did our conference in the North Island. I flew to the South Island to go trout fishing. This was a picture that was sent to me by the guide who I met down there and was, took me fishing. I stayed at his house, really nice guy. Um, but what I think about it, I, I, just, I kept the slide up originally because I'm like, at that talk, I was like, I'm going fishing. Here's what I'm excited for. But then I realized that a lot of the work that I do is a lot like fishing. So the morning, one of the mornings we went out fishing with this gentleman, who he's probably in his 70s, I would say, really understood fishing, right? And so he got up and he, we're outside of his house and he's looking around and there's kind of a little bit of a breeze and not much, but it was something pretty subtle. And he said, hey, Todd, listen, I'm thinking about something. If the wind is going five miles an hour towards the north, which it might be, I'd like to go 50 kilometers to the east. If it's not, I want to fish down the road two kilometers. So that's a pretty big decision to make based on a subtle wind effect. But like I said, it was his experience that helped us understand that. He wasn't sure which way it would go. We decided to go the long route, which ended up being fairly productive, but it might not have. And so that, I feel like the experience that people get from working with people on the spectrum, what I recommend to everybody who's in the field is, you have to just live it and be in it and see it on a daily basis. Like anything else, experience really pays off. And so the other part too about fishing is, let's say we went to the, the other place and it didn't go well, we would sort of look at each other and say, oh, well, it didn't work out. We're always ready. So when I go fishing, I'll go to a place that I think, all right, based on the temperature and the water and stuff, it should be good. But I know that at any given point, I might get no hits. And I could also stumble over something just walking down a path and find a stream and start catching many fish. The hopes are that with our experience and understanding how these behaviors work, how we can relate to people on the spectrum, how we can involve families and the people involved in it really help drive the ship. And so I recommend for those that are in the, in the clinical field to definitely just spend time working with people on the spectrum, getting to know them. And I always tell the families, too, when they come through my door, the first evaluation is simply just for me to learn as much as I can. I say it's rare that I have a treatment plan after meeting for an hour and a half. It could take three or four visits for us to get some momentum, too. So I respect the fact that we have to be patient as well as um, understand the subtleties of these things in order to make good progress. So I love to fish, and I love to work with people on the spectrum. And it's, um, like I said, sometimes it can feel like, sometimes I've gone fishing and wished I hadn't gone out that day because I'm wet and cold and didn't catch anything. And sometimes at work, I feel the same way. It's been a rough day trying to help some very severely affected people feel better. And we didn't, I didn't do what I thought we would want to, but we just persevere and we keep going. And eventually we'll make some sort of progress. 
So oh, this is my last slide. So I just put, um, this is where I work. So I, um, thankfully when I started this service, I just got the name in it. So I called it the Autism Spectrum Disorders Clinic. The Child Psychiatry Consult Service, I don't really use. It was something, a title that came up. But I'm down in Providence, the Brown Center for Children. And that's my phone number um, to our clinic. And that's also my email. So any feel, feel free to um, contact me in any way. I'm pretty available. And I do a lot of, I enjoy doing the work at A&E. And I enjoy their uh, philosophy and process and um, living in the spectrum. And so I'm always happy to participate in all A&E events and stuff. So... Um, so that's the end and I'm just checking the time here. It is 744. So that's good. Um, cause I definitely want to leave some time for questions and I apologize if I missed some pop-ups that came up. And so, um, I will go to the chat. So I, thank you, Todd. Can you oh, hear me? The so, oh, was, you so I'm sorry. <laughs> I missed the results from the, um, one versus two. So it looks as though. As I'd expect, thankfully, that um, it was pretty even. I mean, a little bit more towards number one, which of course was the one on the spectrum versus number two, um, but not too far different. You know, fifty percent versus about sixty percent. So, um, can you I hear will, me, like Todd? I said, I, um, if you have any questions, I think you can post them on chat. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Todd? Oh, it must be, um, let's see. We'll stand by with the questions. I'm speaking. Oh, hey, Joanne, I cannot, hold on a second, I cannot hear you, so let me. Joanne? Hello? Yeah, okay. Oh, there you go, excellent. I turned my sound down because as I was doing the video, I apologize. Okay, no problem. Uh, actually, if you want to, I have a few um, questions that came in ahead of time for tonight's talk. Oh yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. If um, if you can turn down your volume some because I'm I'm hearing myself. Actually. Sure. You know what I can do is. Okay. Uh, how's that? That's a little better. Okay. Okay. So as the audience is typing questions for you, we'll get started with these. The first one is, uh, what do you think about the medication 10X to treat anxiety and PTSD in someone with AS? Yeah, so um, in terms of as anxiety, and you said 10X, and what was the other one? It was only 10X to treat anxiety oh, yeah. and PTSD. So 10X is, the generic form is guanfacine. So it's interesting. So guanfacine tends to work on um, arousal levels too. So remember we talked about post-traumatic stress having high arousal levels. Um, that tends to slow that down, including the gas of that EDR is tends to be slowed down a bit by the 10X. As an anxiety medication, it doesn't necessarily get to the core symptoms of autism. It tends to work on a different neurochemical area. Serotonin, which is what the SSRIs do, tends to be more, and the um, and GABA, which the benzodiazepines do, tend to be more anxiety. However, 10x as an arousal measure and slowing that down is very important. And let's put it this way: <clears throat> I think they are related. I think they're they're interwoven into that. Meaning, anxiety is part hyperarousal. So I can see how 10x would indirectly benefit someone who's experiencing um, anxiety for sure. And by indirectly, I don't mean that it's, you know. Um, off the top, you know, off to the side, but neurochemically, I think it's a little bit different. But yes, so I understand that is a clonidine is another one that is often used in the same respect. So yeah, it's very helpful. Okay. So let's. I'm gonna, I have one here. Do you want to read another one, Joanne, or should I read the one that came in front of me? Why don't you read the one that just came in? Okay. So I'm reading. Um, I have a client who has anxiety and OCD and ASD. He pursues friendships with peers who are also ASD and have great disdain for him due to his challenging behaviors. He continues to pursue friendships with these peers versus peers who are more suited. Is this a compulsive behavior or OCD or neither? So not knowing the case um, in particular, um, it's a very common experience. And so, um, um, and this might be a little related, I don't because I don't know the case as well. The pursuit of, um, people who are not what we consider to be a good social milieu or certainly not responsive 
might be a function of reading or interpreting behaviors as well too without knowing the case. So I have many, a common one I experience is for um, someone with Asperger's who's in high school who wants to be friends with the coolest kids who might be nice and receptive, but also might um, be kind of negating, dismissive, and maybe a little bit mean. And so parents are struggling mightily to say, is this a group of friends that makes sense for you to have fulfillment? Um, so that's one, that, so that's a layer on the spectrum that I'm very familiar with. The OCD part for me would come in is when it starts to be um, worrisome, compulsive. There can be so many, like, um, is so-and-so going to um, call me back? Is so-and-so going to get me on social media? No one's friending me. That can be obsessive, too. So it really depends on the case, but I, I, I think there could be two different layers there. One is um, understanding people's social responsiveness as well as some obsessive behaviors as well. Okay. Um, so our next question is, Having witnessed the big difference that medication in the form of an antidepressant can make to a 17-year-old with AS, often affected by crippling anxiety, what is the most recent advice on the use of medication and its possible long-term effects? That's a good question. So the reality is we don't have many medication studies that address long-term effects. Long-term effects in, in scientific research tend to be 12 weeks, six weeks, you know, half a year, basically. Experientially, I've now been doing this long enough where I've had some people that have been on meds five, 10, eight years, something like that. And um, what I can say is, <clears throat> scientifically, look at what this and these medications do. <clears throat> Excuse me. They raise serotonin levels. Many different, our body is full of serotonin receptors, both in the gastrointestinal tract and the genital urinary tract and all over the body. So side effects can be gastrointestinal, they can be sexual, they can be headaches, stomach aches, a variety of things. But thankfully, I haven't seen any long-term consequences of being on these meds for multiple years. Now, the thing that I think gets lost in psychiatry is that we're often um, very comfortable with just having people stay on meds for a long time thinking, okay, well, they've been on it, it's worth let's keep them on it. What I've often done, not because I'm worried about the side effects, but because people change developmentally at all ages, whether they be five years old, 17 year olds, 25 year old, people change. And so what I usually tell families is, if after about a year of stability, what I mean by that is the anxiety is under good control for about a year, we can actually consider trying to come off of the medication. And not because I'm worried about long-term side effects, but because the bodies change. So I'm more worried about people using meds without considering the fact they might not need them more than I am about long-term side effects, physical or emotional or anything like that. Okay, excellent. So the next question, let me just pull it up. This is, I have heard that mood regulation medications can have the opposite effects than is expected for individuals on the spectrum. Is this true? If so, uh, which meds and why? And then, if I heard that was the mood stabilization or mood meds? mood regulation meds. Yeah. So, um, so the general rule of thumb I find, and this is what I've learned from the research as well as my experience, is that people on the spectrum are generally more vulnerable to side effects um, and also less likely to get the beneficial effects. And so. In the anxiety realm, I see less of the doing the opposite effect. The times that I see more opposite effect tend to be on the ADHD medicines. We start Ritalin for someone who we think has ADHD and they get more hyper. Um, I guess the benzodiazepines, Ativan and Lorazepam for anxiety, sometimes can disinhibit someone to the point where they get loopy and um, disruptive while they're trying to treat their anxiety. In terms of mood stabilizers, which I didn't get into, it just it wasn't part of the talk things like lithium and Depakote and Risperidone. I haven't necessarily seen a paradoxical effect, meaning the opposite of what we'd expect. Mostly I see that in the ADHD medications. Okay. So Todd, there's two questions that came up in the question and answer mm -hmm. little box. Do you want me to read those to you? Sure, go for it. Okay. I'll look at them too, while you're reading. So the first one is, can you talk about the difference between phobias and OCDs and different strategies to help treat these. 
I'm working with a young woman who is afraid of babies for fear that they will cry and the wind. Mm, that's an excellent question. So phobias tend to be, and that's a probably I'll include that in the next thing. When I revise this talk, I should include phobias. It's a good point. Um, the um, basically the phobia is a very strong specific fear of a very specific thing heights um and i think in this case it looked like it was babies crying and things um the phobias tend to be not necessarily related to obsessions what i mean by that is phobias are definitely avoided so people with phobias won't go you know they won't go near snakes they won't go on up ladders they'll stay away from those things they don't necessarily obsess about them they're avoidant of them the OCD part usually comes in when there is a compulsive, repetitive quality to it, meaning like, let's say I'm afraid of spiders, or let's say I'm afraid of snakes and I live in Alaska, you know, northern Alaska where there's no snakes. I might be saying, like, right, I'm not around snakes, I don't have, if I see one, I'll freak out, but I'm not worried about it. The obsessive person tends to start wondering where they are, how they're coming about, what's going on. And so that's where I think a phobia which is an avoidance of a certain supply becomes an obsession, meaning I have to avoid. Now, the babies and things like that is a tougher one, too, because obviously we're around those. And certainly have other patients, some of my patients get very reactive around that. So if there is a ritualistic avoidance and some sort of um, compensatory compulsions, like maybe checking, you know, areas to make sure that's low, there's less babies there or asking if the restaurant's going to have any babies that could get into the obsessive compulsive mode. But if it's generally just, I'm avoiding it. And if I'm away from them, I'm feeling safe. That would probably lend itself more to phobia. Okay. But Another also that the treatment might be similar. Meaning if you take a cognitive behavior approach, you might be doing similar tactics of trying to desensitize that person um, walk them through certain rituals or certain exercise to help them um, decrease their arousal level. So the treatment might not be terribly different. Okay. The next question is, do you have any thoughts on newer SSRIs like, and I believe it's Vibrid? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I haven't, um, I don't know um, much about Vibrid. In fact, I really don't know anything about it. What usually happens for the newer SSRIs, um, it's usually, with, and this is this is not to be cynical about drug companies, but there is a reality to this that what happens is a drug company creates a new version of an old theme. And it's not, like I said, we do need new meds, but in psychiatry in particular, another SSRI um, is an opportunity for patents and things like that too. So whenever I see a new antidepressant, antipsychotic or whatever, it's usually a new version of an old theme. I haven't, and the, the interesting part is, I don't, know if I, I don't know that med well at all, but I can say when new meds have come out, generally what happens is they're not more effective in treating what they're supposed to treat, but generally they have different side effect profiles. They might have different dosing strategies. That's a big thing drug companies do is they want to, like for ADHD meds, they want once a day dosing, which is more convenient. Um, so there are little strategies that say, we're going to make the, the med more convenient to take and less likely to cause side effects. So that's generally the trend I see in new meds that come out. But let's look into that med that was just mentioned. Okay. So the next question is, I heard taking anti-anxiety medicines can help teens be less impulsive and engage in risky behavior. Can you speak to this? Wait, say that, I'm sorry, I missed that last, the, say the beginning again. I heard that taking anti-anxiety meds can help teens be less impulsive and engage in risky behaviors or engage in fewer risky, risky behaviors. Behavior. Can you speak to this? Um, I would say if there is an underlying anxiety or mood component to it, as a standalone issue to say that an SSRI, now everyone's into, like, this is just speaking from experience. This doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It just means when I think about impulsivity and risk-taking behaviors, that can be, they can come from very different places. It can come from an ADHD standpoint. It could come from a mood standpoint. It could come from an anxiety standpoint. So usually when I see those types of behaviors, my, my thought process takes me to, are there core issues of anxiety, mood, or ADHD that lend themselves to treating those types of behaviors, basically? So 
So yes, I would say SSRIs could be helpful for those particular situations. However, um, it would really depend upon underlying anxiety and mood issues as well. And also, Joanne, I just, I'm sorry, Joanne, I just had a question come up. Should I read this one or you want to, I can read the one that just came up in front of me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So I have a young adult, 20 years, recently diagnosed with AS. Only diagnosed with AS because of crippling anxiety caused by going away to college for the first time. Should the treatment focus on the anxiety or the Asperger's? Um, good, excellent question. I would say both. And so there's two things I think about. One of which is, and it, you know, I always think of Asperger's as being the fertile ground upon which other things can rise, like mood issues, like attention issues, um, uh, many things like that. And so oftentimes what I find, so when I'm doing new, new diagnoses, which I've done recently with two um, females in their 30s and I think one in their 50s at this point, is the sort of reconciliation that there is a process in autism that can explain some of the quirkiness and odd behaviors that the person felt they were like a foreign visitor about and understanding, hey, this is not, I'm not alone in this. This is a thing that can be treated and there are others like me can often be therapeutic in itself. So I think orienting ourselves and thinking, what does Asperger's feel like? What is it like? Why am I like that? Introducing the fact that many people with Asperger's do not feel themselves as having a disorder, which I agree with. There's a variant of normal. So I think going that route and really addressing what Asperger's feels like, and there's always a long history, even a young man like that or a young woman, of tremendous stress. And I always, and I think it's a good exploration to say, let's talk about what your experiences were and how we contextualize that in someone on the spectrum, and that can be very helpful. And of course, if the anxiety is there as a standalone issue, whether it's caused by the Asperger's or not, we can do both. So anxiety treatment, meds and therapy, along with the sort of Asperger's reconciliation part, by all means. So I do both at the same time. Okay, and it looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, this came in to us earlier today. It's, I have a client who, can visualize a ball and chain wrapping around his arm. He uses a tape to stop the ball from rattling. Is this anxiety or would this be something like OCD? I'm sorry, he used, I'm sorry, what was the thing that he uses to stop the ball from rattling? It sounds as though he puts tape on his arm to prevent the ball from, from spinning any further. I see. So there's a physical, so he's putting a physically tape around his arm as a result of this metaphorical concept of there being a ball and chain on his arm. Exactly. I see. Okay. So that is an interesting one. I, I It's an interesting one too, because it, it, it to have a concrete physical process relating to a sort of conceptualization of what's going on makes total sense. Um, whether that's a, whether that's OCD or whether, you know, there's OCD is a tough one too, because um, the OCD part would be delineated or I would ask questions about as you, as things as you might've already done, is there a worry about this? Is there a compulsive behavior associated with the tape? Meaning I need this piece of tape around my arm in order to function. If I don't have the tape, bad things will happen. Or is the tape more of a symbolic sort of gesture of, this helps to ground me in my experience and helps me navigate through certain situations too. So it always comes down to the OCD is always about the repetitive intrusive thoughts and the repetitive behaviors to counteract that as well too. So that's interesting. Cool. I think it's cool in the sense that it's um, nice to have um, sort of some, something that you're doing physically to help modulate your anxiety. Okay. So it's eight o'clock and we have just one more question. Do you have time for that, Todd? Yes. Is this okay. the one from, uh, can you explain what you mean by mood issues? Yes. Yes, cool. So can you explain what you mean by mood issues and how that is separate from the other issues you were addressing? So mood issues for me represents um, depression and mania, right? That's usually what we talk about in mood. So depression, depressed mood, problem sleeping, dysphoria, generally, you know, defined by sadness and blue and uh, blue mood. Mania is sort of the opposite, which we didn't really talk about, which is hyper arousal, feelings of invincibility, risk taking behavior, all those types of things too. So I think anxiety, so mood 
depression versus um, mania are on a separate sort of like metric and anxiety is sort of parallel to that too. So you can have depression and mania, but it tends to be separate from anxiety. People with depression can have anxiety, people with mania can have anxiety, but definitely when I think of mood, it's, it's depression or mania. And generally, I, uh, it's much more about depression for me. I don't see much mania um, in general and specifically in autism too. So that's what I meant by mood. Okay, excellent. So that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you very much, Todd, for doing this. It's yeah. been excellent. And uh, like I said at the beginning, this presentation is being recorded. So if you didn't catch the whole thing, you'll be receiving a link to the video on Thursday. So with that, I'm going to say good night and um, take care. And on June 8th, we'll be continuing our webinar series with anxiety and employment. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Todd. Good night.